Give the Lord a big hand. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord and to see my brothers and sisters who I've been laboring with for many, many years. And so I'd just like to maybe take this moment since we've taken communion and we love the brethren to turn to maybe about five people and either give them a handshake, welcome them, or give them a holy kiss if you're there at that point, because we are one body and one blood, amen, in Jesus Christ, hallelujah. I will enter in his gates with thanksgiving in my heart i will enter in his courts with praise i will say this is the day that the lord has made i will rejoice for he has made me glad oh he has oh he has i will rejoice i will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will he has made me glad. I will rejoice. For he has made me glad. I'll enter. I will enter in his with thanks in my heart. I will enter in his with praise. I will say this that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has Come on, I don't see smiles on your face. Somebody turn to somebody and smile at them and give them a smile or something. Give somebody a high five or something. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen. Somebody say it's time for the word. It's time for the word. Everybody say it's time for the word. It's time for the word. Are you glad for the word of God? Yes. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's really good to see you guys. God bless you amen well you know the big question mark especially when people come to the faith or even on this on the border is i want to know god i just want to know god i want to be right with god if there is a god how can i tap into god you know this is the burden and the cry of all people i believe whether they admit it or not they're looking for something more purpose peace happiness and they don't know where to look but deep inside, what it really is, is a passion. I want to know my creator. I want to know what life is all about. And how do I do it? You know, sometimes we get so used to just coming to church, and we get stuck into this routine. We come to church, we read the Bible, and, and we just get lost in these routines. And we're like, I, I, am I really growing? Am I knowing God? Have I experienced God? And and, and if I am or if I'm not, I, I, I definitely want to. I mean, that's the reason why I became a Christian. I want to know God. I want to be with God. And so if you're here today and you're saying, I just want to know God, uh, I don't know if there's a witness here. Does anybody really want to know God? Amen. I do. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you're here today and you want to know God uh, and, and closer, um, I, I'm going to just, by the grace of God, just expound on the Word of God and show you how you can do it, how you can do it. It's very important. You know, God said in Isaiah chapter 55, if you want to turn your Bibles with me in verses 8 to 10, uh, what he said in his word is this, very important. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Okay, that's very, very key. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And so the way you're thinking right now, uh, that's not necessarily God's thoughts unless you're aligned with his thoughts. And he goes, neither are your ways my ways. So I'm very different is what God is saying. I'm different from you. So whatever preconceived notion you had about me, that's probably wrong. Whatever you thought in the flesh that that's what I was, you're probably wrong. 
Um, so this is key to knowing God. He is not you. He is not a man that he should lie. He's not a frail person. He's not a sinner. He is not you at all. He's higher than you. The Bible says, for as high as the heavens are uh, than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, this passage is, is, is striking. This could be a whole message in itself about God's thoughts and our thoughts, God's ways and our ways. But one thing that we should glean from this is that sometimes we're thinking about life and relationships one way, but it's really not that way. The Bible says that God is nearer to the breath, nearer to us than the breath that we breathe. And so that means God is always there, but we just didn't recognize him. You know, isn't that amazing? God could actually be right in front of you right now. He could be the person sitting beside you. He could have, that could have been, a, uh, uh, I guess, a theophany of God, and you wouldn't even know. The Bible says sometimes when we're hosting people, we're actually hosting angels, the presence of the Lord. You know, it, it's even more uh, remarkable that God came in the flesh through Jesus Christ. He was walking amongst his own people, and the Bible says, my people didn't even know me. And yet they were in church, they were reading the Bible, they were quoting everything, they were saying prayers. And when God actually showed up, they didn't recognize him. You know, some people are so focused on words and mistakes of words and, or, or how someone communicates and, and, and about God, which is, you know, we want to communicate right. But the funny thing is, is that we can emphasize on our communication, but... I wonder if we're, we, we see how we are actually living with God. I mean, that's, that's also important. I mean, we want to say the right thing, but we also want to do the right thing. We want to actually know God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, 21, and I quote this a lot, he says, there's going to be many people that are calling my name and doing things in my name, but at the end of the day, I'm going to say, I never knew you. And you know what that means? If, if, if they didn't know, uh, if God didn't know them, that means they didn't really know God. Maybe they knew about God. Maybe they knew the power of his name, but they didn't actually have a relationship with God. I mean, what's the point of coming to church every single week and you don't know God? You're not actually in his presence. I want to be in the presence of the Lord. Somebody said to me yesterday, he said, you know, I was at a place and I could feel the presence of the Lord and I want to see this in my church, you know, and, and I'm just so excited to know that there is a way that we can experience God every single day and we can know his power in a greater way if we just abide by his thoughts and his ways. And so one of the first ways to really know God to really know God is to acknowledge that your ways and your thoughts are not his. That means we need to repent. We need to repent. We need to actually give up our own way of thinking, our own lifestyle, and surrender it to what God thinks. And this is not easy, saints of God. It is not easy to abandon our emotions, okay? We live by emotions. And this is why sometimes we, we see people do some strange things for the Lord. Like there's some women here that cover their heads and there's some women that don't. And, and I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to tell you you're bad, you're good, because there's some people that dress a certain way and they're bad. And there's some people that dress a certain way and they're good. Amen. And what do I mean by good? Jesus said, no man is good but God alone. So I'm not saying you are perfectly good. But some people have a good heart, like David. He was a man after God's own heart, but he was a failure. So we can't always judge by appearance. But sometimes people do things because they are trying to at least align their thoughts with God's thoughts. It's not always about how we feel. Now, we might feel to, to do the most craziest things in the flesh, fornicate, steal, do, uh, you know, be nasty to somebody because they hurt us, but that's not God's ways, is it? And if we live in the flesh, we will be denying the spirit. If we, if we live in our sin, we will be denying righteousness. And so the first thing is we need to come to a place to admit that something is wrong with us. This is step number one. This is why John the Baptist preceded Jesus Christ, because how can you receive a savior? How can you receive God unless you know God is different? 
you got to know he's different from you. And when you know he's different from you and you give up the way of your life for God's life, then all of a sudden you can enter into his presence. Acts chapter 17, 27 harnesses this idea and it says that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from any one of us. Acts chapter 3 also repeats a similar sentiment of seeking the Lord and, and feeling after him by saying that we can receive times of refreshing when we repent. When we turn from our ways. So this goes down to a deeper thing. How do I know God? How do I get close to God? Well, how can we repent if our heart is in the wrong place? Matthew chapter 13, verses 3. Jesus talks about a parable. And he says, he spake many things to them in parables. And he said, the sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell on stony places and where there had not been much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell, here, here, here's the good part, on good ground. And, it, and the good ground, what it did is it brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. Jesus later explains that a lot of people receive the word of God, come to church, but not everybody gets close to God. Not everybody makes it to their final destination because their heart was in the wrong place. You see, a lot of people go to the gym. In fact, in the beginning of the year, everybody gets a gym membership. I was one of them for many, many years. I want to start over a new leaf. I want to lose weight. So I enter into a gym, buy a membership, and I go for one week. But what happens? The thorns of life creep in, the, the stony parts of my life. I just love the double cheeseburger planes from McDonald's. Um, you know, the busyness of life comes in, distractions come in. And what that really does is it tests my heart, tests your heart. Every day we're being tested. But the one that has the right heart, the good ground, the, the heart that is determined, that has made up their mind and says, you know what, I believe truly that his thoughts are greater than mine. His ways are better than mine. And by coming to that conversion place in our hearts, we are now determined to go forward. And that's what separates the sheep from the goats. That's what separates those who get in shape from those who never get in shape. There has to come to a place where you really want something so bad that you are not going to turn back. I don't know if there's anybody here that wants God so bad that they're not going to turn back no matter what. Amen. see if they should seek the Lord and happily they might feel after him and find him the Bible says seek and you will find knock and the door will be open unto you and ask and you shall receive another uh, uh, in, in going down in chapter 13 this is what Jesus said about the heart we're trying to get to know God and he says in verses 14 and in them is fulfilled the promise Praise the Lord. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see and you shall not perceive. For their people's heart, there we go, the heart is waxed gross. And their ears are dull of hearing. What is it that makes a person heart waxed gross when i think of that just an image comes to mind of a candle and a wick you know in order to burn out a candle you have to go through the wax and if our heart is just so clouded and colluded and and covered by so many things it's very difficult for the fire to get down to the core to actually change you i wonder if we've actually come to the place to acknowledge that god's ways are right these people have not gotten there. And it says their ears are dull, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time, any time, they should see with their eyes. And so what God is saying is that any time, I'm ready. I'm ready for you right now. I'm ready for you to have a breakthrough right now. I'm ready to fill you right now. 
right now. It's not my problem. It's just that many people's eyes are closed, ears are dull, and hearts are waxed with so many things. Because he says at any time, they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted. The Bible says, and I will heal them. This is a promise. And, and if you say you believe in God, you have to acknowledge he's not a liar. Okay, he is not a liar. If he said, I will heal you, that means he will heal you. It doesn't mean he might heal you. He would have said, I might. He might have said, well, you know what, if you're, you're good and, 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 and put all these other restrictions and requirements. But he said, if you would just hear and understand, I will heal you. Wow, what an amazing uh, word. It, it, you know, we need to approach God right if you want to know God. You got to see him for who he is. And this is why I've always said to people, I said, you know, I have no problem if I see something in the word of God, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I've already tried and tested God to see that he's right. And I've failed miserably so many times. I'm going I'm to tell you that I haven't always obeyed God in everything he told me to do, okay? But I've disobeyed God and seen God's power so many times that I've become convinced that everything in the word, even if it's hard, Brother Aaron, even if it seems strange, even if it means me losing my friends and losing my reputation, I would rather trust God because he always comes through at the end of the day. I become convinced of this. And so this is the reason why the Bible is so important, how you view God and how you view his words and view the Bible. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is birthed from heaven. It's perfect. It's pure. The Bible says it's eternally written in the heaven. So if you really want to grow, you want to know God and get the refreshing, you got to change your mind. you got to be willing to see that God has a different plan for you. And I'm so glad there is a different plan because everybody's following the agenda of the government, following the agenda of the world, and everybody's almost doing the same things. Every fall every winter the same styles come out the same people are setting the trends i remember uh my wife was saying something to me uh, uh recently because uh, i was packing my bags for ethiopia and i and i like this jean jacket suit a blue jean jacket suit it's old school 1990s and she <laughs> she looked at me and said david they, they, that's not in style in ethiopia okay they don't wear that anymore i said i don't care i'm a trendsetter i'm not a follower amen I set the trends, amen? It's coming back in style, amen? I just like certain things, amen? Everybody just likes to follow everything else. But I, I, I want to I wanna follow the Lord because he's proven himself to me. And this is why the word of God will actually bring you to the presence of God. The words of God, every word is made for a reason. Hebrews chapter 5 and 13 says something about um milk and a baby he says everyone that uses milk unskillfully or or that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe okay and that's pointing to uh, a bigger principle is that when you're a babe and you're and you're just taking in the little things it, it's not gonna get you to the place you need to be and I'm, and I'm saying this to those who are just babes in Christ and have this like one second scripture thing and, and don't actually take the time to meditate and get deeper. If you really want to get deeper, you can't just take a little bit of milk here and there and, 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 and go about your day. If you really want to get strong, you can't just come to the gym once a week and think that you're going to get in shape. And that's why you get disappointed Saints of God, I, I mean, I failed so many times in trying to get in shape. And, and for those of you that know me, I, I've been on this journey. And until I finally met this one coach, and, you know, I, I should be ashamed of myself. I, I, I know the disciplines. I know what to do. But sometimes you just need somebody by your side to help you. And my coach was, is, is like a, a, no, a no compromise coach. He's a coach that says there are no cheat days. There are no, if, if, if I don't send the picture exactly by the minute that it's due, I failed for the day. And, you know, this is how God sees things. You know, one little sin it doesn't make you, you know, righteous. It actually makes you a sinner. 
You have failed. And the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You are not going to make your destination if you keep having cheat moments and you keep making compromises and excuses for why you didn't make it. And in fact, the reason why I didn't lose weight before is because I was making excuses. That's it. That's it. I mean, there is, there is no excuse why we shouldn't know God. When God says at any time, I'm ready. I'm always here. There is no excuses. So if we say, well, God's not hearing me, it's not God that God's not speaking. He's always speaking. It's just that you're not listening. It's not that God wants anybody to go to hell or anybody to perish. The Bible says he wishes that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is God's desire. But is that our desire? So a lot of us Christians, we just don't want to go deep. We, we come to church for the hour, and we're even watching the time. Oh, Pastor David's piece a long time. I'm going to give him maybe 30, 40 minutes, and then I'm out. Well, some people, I, they say, don't stop. And I'm like, I know, I know, but it's for the new people. If I, if I keep preaching three hours, they're, they're never going to come back. <laughs> I'm trying to find the balance, amen? So today it'll just be two out. No, I'm sorry. Praise the Lord. But you can't, if you really want God, like, I, you know, I always marvel when people come to church, but then they don't want God in the week. Like, why even bother? Like, why don't you just live out your lifestyle? I mean, just having a token Christianity on the corner or having a little picture of Jesus in the, the corner and saying, you know, I'm going to be with God one day or, you know, this shows that I'm a Christian. In fact, no, it shows that it shows that you don't really love the God that you claim you love. It shows that Christianity is more of just something you're showing people that you have, but it's not really a relationship. You see, if you really believe in God and you want God, he will become a part of your daily life. It's not going to be just drinking milk. It's going to be wanting to grow. And it says here in 1 Peter, um, sorry, it says here in, in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 5, verses 12, it says, for when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and, a, and not of strong meat. And so we're seeing here that, that there is a, a call from God that, hey, listen, I have something for you, but you have to want it. I want you to be a leader. I want you to be successful. I want you to be prosperous, but you have to be willing to eat the tougher things with your teeth. And chewing meat when you are a baby is very difficult. It could hurt your gums. Do you know it hurts to get on your knees in the morning when you're so comfortable? You know it hurts to stay in prayer longer than five minutes if you're used to 30-second prayers? You know, it hurts to turn off your cell phone when you're so addicted to seeing what somebody has to say about you just so that you can see what God has to say about you. It hurts. Why? Because God's ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. His spirit is different from the things of the world. So you almost have to just adapt to something different. This is why when people say, you know, God loves me for who I am, uh, not really. <laughs> Yes, he loves you as a human being. He loves you because you're made in the image of God. But who you are has become disgusting in the eyes of God. Your ways have made you disgusting. Your, your, even your, very, your presence has been so clouded by the devil that it, 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 it can't be approved by God. Because if he approved that, then heaven would be disgusting too. He, God's not going to approve of you regardless if you're... Uh, you know, married for 10 years, but you're in a homosexual marriage. I apologize for sounding crude, but it is not a marriage according to the eyes of God. And it will never be blessed by God because God never blessed it. Amen. God is not approving of your living with your girlfriend behind closed doors and, and, and you never got permission from the father. You're not, you're not doing things right. It, it, you might love each other, but it's not love in the eyes of God. God's thoughts are not your thoughts. Your, his ways are not your ways. And so we need to come back uh, to the, the meat of the word of God. The meat is difficult to accept because everybody else does the milk. Everybody just wants to hear, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible says so. But do you know that when it comes to you loving God, you wanting God, that means something else, keeping his commandments. 
Amen. Keeping his commandments. You know, one of the other ways that we can get to know God and know uh, and, and, and really grow with God, um, it, it's spoken in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Sorry, the same thing that I just want to harness. It says in verses uh, 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaker, speaking as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby if so be that you have tasted that the lord is gracious okay so you're not going to experience the lord if you're living in sin so repentance is required change of mind is required and you're not going to grow in your relationship with god until your heart desires it to such a point that you want it above everything else and it says, if so be that you tasted that the Lord is good. The reason why I want to walk with God, I want to know God, is because from what I've tasted, it was good. And so I'm willing to risk my life and put everything aside for more of this oil in my life. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You know, talking about the word of God, I was on Facebook today and somebody said something that was so untrue. He's coming from a camp that believes that God doesn't speak prophetically. And he was like, the King James Version is all we need and, and, and that's all that's important. And I agree, we need the Bible. The Bible is the standard, the final authority of all matters. But um, I read and he said, well, prophecy, it doesn't exist. God doesn't speak like that anymore. And, you know, I thought to myself, well, if God doesn't speak like that anymore, then how is he calling people to be saved? I'm sure that your name is not written in the Bible. The Bible says many are called and few are chosen. He also said, my sheep hear my voice. Now, you know, I, I don't know about you, but that means God is personally calling you amen and and that doesn't always mean someone's sitting around and reading the bible sometimes someone's in a club and they hear the voice of god in a spiritual way or somebody comes to them that was actually god speaking prophetically to you if you're here today and you're being convicted this is god using pastor david in the prophetic i might not even know that god is using me in the prophetic but if he's speaking to your heart he's reaching you in such a way because god is trying to bring you out of the world and so a prophetic word spoke in season by God can actually help you to grow. Where am I getting that? I'm getting that from Psalms 119 verses 49 and 51. This is why we need prophecy. God already knew that we needed prophecy. He, we, he knew that we not only need his written word, but we need his, his manifest word specifically to us just so that we would not doubt him so that we can actually grow and continue on in the journey. It says here, verses 49, remember the word unto your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has quickened me. So God, somewhere along the line, spoke to his servant David, and it caused him to hope. Amen. You see, when God speaks prophetically, he does something in your heart that causes you to have hope. And your hope will motivate you to go through affliction. You see, if there was never a word of hope, if there was never a word of promise, if there was never a God from heaven speaking to you, letting you know it's going to be okay, and all you had was the written word, you could easily dismiss the written word and say, well, that was written to the Corinthians. That was written to the Thessalonians. That was written to David. That was written to Moses. That was written to the Israelites. But God, what about me? What about me? I think as a church, what we need is not only the word, but we need to, to seek the Lord for a rhema word. We need to seek the Lord for a prophetic word that's specifically to you, that you know that you know that God is intervening in your situation. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 15 and 23 repeats that sentiment. It says, a word has joy, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season how good is it? Now, this can come through a person, and it can come through God. So if you really want to know God, I mean, we've already learned a couple principles. Repentance, the word of God, desiring it, 
but also asking God, give me a prophetic word. I want to hear your voice. Speak to me. Pay attention when you wake up in the morning. This is why spending time with God in the morning is so important because you're setting your day. You're setting the atmosphere. You're saying, God, I'm willing to listen to you. And now when you step out of your house, somebody says something, it's not going to be a mundane word or a mundane situation because you've already prepared your thoughts and your ways to receive something different. You're already looking at things different. This is how we receive a prophetic word. I, I, I guarantee you every person in here has heard prophetic words somewhere along the line. You may just not have known it. Amen. That little voice on the left saying, go this way. That little voice on the right, go that way. That little, that little, uh, that person that comes and reminds you of the truth. You know how many times, some, even when I was in the world, I remember I was going to do some crazy stuff. I remember a pastor came on the bus and he just targeted me. It seemed like God was, his hand was already, always on my life because he would always send different people to speak to me. And they would always look at me differently than everybody else in my group because God had his hands on me. Sad part about it, though, is I was trying to ignore it. Amen. I was trying to not listen to what God wanted to say in those days because I was being rebellious. But deep down inside, I knew God was speaking to me. I just didn't want to know. I wonder if you can look back in the pages of your life and ask yourself, has there ever been moments where God was speaking? Sometimes it's through a television show. You're, you're, you're trying to sin and you turn on a television show and all of a sudden that television preacher or that that non-preacher, that somebody just saying exactly what you need to hear. Sometimes it's in a song, and it's in most random songs. I, I knew somebody that went to a club, and, 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 and they apparently accepted the Lord, and God was leading them away from that, but they were being disobedient. They end up going to the club. They end up hearing this song from Mary Mary inside of a club. So some of you are dissing the urban gospel, and I totally understand why. But I want you to know that God, when he loves somebody so deeply, he will use urban gospel, reggae gospel, whatever, rock gospel, just to get uh, attuned to some of those rebellious Christians. Amen? Amen. So this person left the club right away <laughs> because they were like, God is here. God is in the club. Amen? Jesus walks with me. Amen. Hallelujah. If we really want to know God, God honors us when we have good character. Psalms chapter 92 and 12, it says, the righteous will flourish like the palm tree. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Now that brings me back to another Psalm, Psalms chapter 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walks this way, not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man that walks not in the way of sinners, nor is seated in, 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 in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, again, this is the heart issue, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night, day and night. So this is more than milk. This is now meat. You're chewing on things. You're regurgitating. You're thinking deeply about things day and night. And the Bible says he's going to be like a tree planted and will bring forth his fruit in his season. And so our character, when we are ready to receive, when we're submitted to the things of God, we will grow. First Peter chapter 1 and 4 says this. It says, whereby are given unto us exceedingly and great precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust okay we've already given up our ways given up our thoughts that's our lusts we've escaped something now we become partakers and he goes on and says this he says beside this okay speaking about our faith giving all diligence add to your faith virtue okay Add to your faith virtue. So somewhere along the line, saints of God, you gave your life to the Lord if you're here. But if you're here and you're saying, I want to grow, I want to be filled with the Spirit, I want to hear prophetic words, I want to be successful, I want to be prosperous, I just want the presence of God all around me, this is the instruction. It said, beside this, add to your faith virtue. Okay? 
Paul the Apostle says in Philippians chapter 4, 6, whatever is virtuous, whatever is noble. The Bible even says in Proverbs 31, it says, who can find a virtuous woman? And it gives a lot of characteristics. I don't know if you're here today, you're a lady, and, and you can say, I am a virtuous woman. Just look at Proverbs 31, and you're going to find the descriptions. What does it mean to be virtuous? So it's not about you are saved by your virtue. It's just that if you really want to find the blessing and receive the promises and walk in the council and know his presence everywhere, his presence is in the virtue. His presence is in his word. His presence is in his thoughts. His presence is in his ways. His success is in the things of the Lord. And it says, add to your virtue knowledge. Okay? You need to be a studious person person in the word you can't just be I, I i listen to pastor david on on saturday that's wonderful you're learning amen but you need to start taking notes you need to go back to the sermon you need to study it for yourself check and see is pastor david right i could be wrong okay you need to study to show yourself approved unto the lord a workman that needs not to be ashamed you don't want to be picking up the wrong tool on the job and then you don't get the job done you need to add to your virtuous conduct knowledge. And you know what happens? You know, I was telling to a young man, and I always explain this. He, the, I always get the question by young men, how do I overcome lust? How do you do it? How do I do it? And you know what? It's not that we will ever fully not have lust inside of our body because, I mean, this is what causes many of us to, to get married, to have desires uh, to, to please our husbands and our wives. If we had no desire, no lust in our body. But there is something between wrong lust and right lust. Wrong lust is when it's misplaced. It's put in the wrong place and we're chasing after things that are not God's will. But the right lust, the right desires is when we chase after the things of God and we can temper it. So what is it that allows a person to be tempered in their lust and not watch porn? It's knowledge. It's knowledge. What is the porn going to do for you in the long run? Are you going to ever get that girl on the porn set? Absolutely not. She doesn't like you. And if you did... Uh, you'd have to pay a lot of money for those ladies, okay? You're not going to get her. And what satisfaction are you really going to get by masturbating for the, for the moment? Uh, most people, they end up becoming more miserable when they masturbate. They, they end up becoming more desperate. It actually destroys your life. And so this knowledge helps me and helps you and should help anybody to temper themselves, to put filters. When you see something that seems attractive, you should have many filters of knowledge to say, wait a second, that's not going to make me successful. That's not going to give me a good family. This is going to destroy my reputation with God. This is not going to fulfill me. So therefore, I turn you off. Very simple. It's not, about, it's not about she's not pretty and he's not handsome. Yes, she's pretty, but how good is she for me? It doesn't fit with my purpose. Therefore, I'm going to go another way. Okay? Knowledge. Add to your faith knowledge. And knowledge temperance okay we can know that some things are really tasty like the mcdonald's double cheeseburger plain and the apple pie on the side with the milkshake i just found out that a small milkshake brother i know you like milkshakes but the small vanilla milkshake has almost like 1500 calories man i loved milkshake especially mcdonald's milkshakes amen but just because i have the knowledge that it tastes good I have to also act in temperance and moderation. I have to know that, okay, it tastes good, but not right now. I love rest, but it doesn't mean I should be lazy and rest forever. I, I love vacations, but I have a job to do. I can't take vacations for the rest of my life. Temperance will allow me to know God because sometimes God doesn't want us to be in the bed. He wants us to be in his presence on our knees. That's where sometimes God speaks prophetically. Add to your faith temperance, and to temperance, patience. Sometimes we're doing everything right, but we got no patience. And how does God know that? By your whining. It comes out of your mouth. You end up going to everybody else, God, not answering me. How, how, how long have you fasted? Well, I fasted for a half a day. I gave up half of a meal. <laughs> well, Jesus fasted for 40, okay? Some of us are just not patient. And I'm, I'm kind of like that. I have that in, I think anybody that grows up in the West has this tendency to not be patient. Some are better than others, but most of us are just not patient because we can get everything at a glimpse, at a snap of a finger. I mean, we want food now. I mean, forget waiting for mom's cooking. I'll get it from Burger King. 
all right? Forget, 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 forget going to the mall and, and walking there. I'm just going to call Uber Eats. It doesn't matter if I'm paying a little more. It's just, it's just quick. You know, time is money. Money is time. Amen. We're just not patient. We don't have the patience to, to spend time with our kids. We don't have the patience for anything. And we definitely don't have the patience to read the Bible. Now we're so impatient or we're so, we're so godly that we don't read anymore. We just listen to the Bible. But, you know, we're a, we're a visual culture, actually. We're not so much of an auditory culture. So, so most of the things that go in our ears come out. We hear so many things all over the place. We don't really pay attention. We would pay attention better if we're looking at it, reading it. And at least that's in, in my story. And it would even be better if you read it, listen, and, and obey it. Amen? That will actually get it right into your system. So patience is how we can get into the glory of the Lord. Patience and godliness and godliness, brotherly kindness and kindness, charity. And it says this in verses 8, and I don't need to explain those ones. It's very straightforward. And this is, again, how we access the presence and the promises of God. It says, if these things be in you and they abound, okay, you put them in your life and you're, you're, you're allowing it to nurture. You're watering these things. You're watering brotherly love. I mean, when, when last have you loved on your brother or sister beside you? You called them, prayed for them, fasted for them. I don't want to know because most of you probably don't even really care, okay? You're too wrapped up in your own life to care about somebody else's. But this, you really want to be in the presence of God. You want to know Jesus. You want to know him intimately. He was a man of brotherly kindness. Amen. He was serving. See, a lot of people run away from church at the first glimpse of problems, not realizing that they're not running away from a church. They're not running away from Pastor David. They're running away from God. Because these are the things that get you into the presence of God, the promises of God. When charity abounds, when these things abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren. Okay, this is important. Nor unfruitful. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. So this is the crux of the matter. Like Jesus said, the sower sows the seed. When you get tested, okay, what happens when you get tested is a demonstration of where you really are. Are you blind? Have you forgotten what Jesus has done for you? Because if you know what Jesus has done and you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, will you not want to walk into his presence? Will you not want to be disciplined in the things of God, spend time with his word, spend time in prayer, operate in the commandments of the Lord because you know that that's where God is? The Bible says when the praises go up, when we, when, when we praise the Lord, uh, he abides in our presence. He abides where, his, where the praises of God are. So how do you get to know God and receive from God? You have to start allowing the things of God into your life. The praises of God. Open your lips when you come to church. doesn't matter what you feel. His thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways are not your ways. His feelings are not your feelings. Okay, we have perverted feelings. So when you come into the house of God and you don't feel like praising, praising God, you are perverted, not God. Because the presence of God in heaven, everybody's praising God. So something's wrong with you. And don't say it's just my personality. No, because there's no, there's no personality in heaven that doesn't want to praise God. I wonder what the personality of the archangel Michael is. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I, all I know is when I see in Isaiah chapter 6, the angels of the Lord are saying, holy, holy, holy. I mean, you got to open. I mean, when you experience, I mean, there is nobody introverted or extroverted here that if they won the lottery, they wouldn't smile. They wouldn't say, yes, they wouldn't call someone on the phone. Okay, so don't give me this excuse. It's just not my personality. I don't like to move my body. Well, when God speaks to you and he starts to move, you're going to, I've seen the most introverted people become the most active when it comes to praising God. When God touched their lives. You see, what we can't do in our own power is what we can do when God is in the mix. But look at the rest of this verse. It says that you shall neither be barren. Okay, that means you're going to be abundant. You're going to be blessed. Nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind. And he goes in verse 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fail. 
or fall, sorry. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. Man, that means the angels will be paving a way, blowing the trumpet. Welcome, David. Welcome, Lucy. Welcome. You want to know God? Here, open access to you because you've added to your faith all the things that God is in. You know, it's very difficult to miss God if he's in a house, if you go in the house. It's very difficult to miss your teacher if you go to the teacher's room, you knock on the door. It's very difficult to, to miss what the teacher wanted you to have if you open the book and you actually ask the questions, do the work. Very difficult to miss. You really want to know God, you need the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've had to say to you. Saints of God, if you really want to grow and be in the presence of the Almighty God and hear his voice, you have to be a person that wants holiness and not just holiness as a virtue, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. You have to want God in your being, in your soul, in your breath, in your words. You have to invite him and ask him and ask him long enough until it becomes a reality. This is how we grow. You know, coming back to the heart, you know, experiencing the Lord, the reason why I pursue the Lord this way is because I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And when you know that he's good and you have experience with God, the promises become alive. But one thing I love about God is he promises things. And if you can get his promises into your soul, it will allow you to move forward in the things of God and grow. Jeremiah chapter 29 and 11. And remember, keep in the back, backdrop, his thoughts are not your thoughts. This is what God says. He says, I know your thoughts that I think, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end a blessed end a good end these are the thoughts of god now you might be saying well god that's my thoughts okay it's you have thoughts like that it's just in the wrong direction how many people thought that they can have a successful end without god a successful end without going to church without jesus without the words of god that's how we think we think success means going to school getting a good job not find not realizing until later you get the good job you get the degree but you have no peace. God is saying, I have it all. I have peace and I have prosperity all in my hands. And it all comes through one way, Jesus. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the only way. So his promises allow us to grow. Matthew chapter 6, 31 to 33 um, speaks about seeking first the kingdom. We see from these, uh, this uh, scripture it says, or rather, I'll just summarize, that God will provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And that's repeated in Philippians 4 and 19. We also see in Philippians 1 and 6, and I'm just going to paraphrase, that one of his promises is that he's going to complete the work that he started. James chapter 1 and 5 also reminds us that if we lack any kind of wisdom or discernment, we can ask of the Lord and he will give it to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 13 also says that whatever trial and temptation you're going through, God is going to make a way of escape. He says in Philippians chapter 4 and 7 that the God of peace will be with you if you're anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer. So what does this tell me? It tells me and tells you that if we can get a hold of the promises of God and believe these promises, that we are now going to receive a breakthrough in our spiritual walk. The promises of God are there to give you enough grace to keep walking forward. And that's exactly where God wants you to go. He wants you to go forward, not backwards. He wants you to know that I am here. That's why he makes promises. And all you need to do with the promises of God, and you should get acquainted with the promises of God. There's so many of them in the Bible. For instance, I know I'm saved because God said I'm saved. Amen? 
He said, if I would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I would be saved. And that's why I know I'm saved. Sometimes I don't feel saved, but I know I'm saved because I do believe. And sometimes my belief needs a bit of help. So I say, God, help my unbelief. But I do believe. I do believe. I've trusted in him. I've seen, I've seen his glory. And that's why I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved because I accepted that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe in him as my Lord and Savior. I received him in my life. And because he said, if I do that, I will be saved, I hold on to his word. And guess what? Just by me holding on to his promises, it's allowed me to see the devil is a liar. Amen. You know how many times the devil would try to tell me I'm not saved. Oh, you suck here. You suck there. I was like, wait a second, devil. The promise says that if I believe on him, I didn't stop believing on him. I might have failed yesterday, but I got back up. The Bible says the righteous man falls seven times, but he's not utterly destroyed. I'm still going forward. You might not like it, devil. But I know I'm saved. If I would have given up just by what I saw, I wouldn't have saw the glory of the Lord. But I see the glory of the Lord now because of his promise. I grew. I grew in my knowledge of the devil. I grew in the knowledge of my own weaknesses, my trials, my temptations. I grew because of the promises. The promises will enable us to grow. The Bible even says that we ought to grow in another thing, grow in the grace of and the knowledge of the Lord. Second Peter chapter 3 and 18 says, Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. Why? Because the more we grow in grace, the more our foundation will be sure. I don't know about you, but if I trusted in myself, it's a shaky foundation. I know that by experience. Amen. How many of you have trusted in yourself and you failed miserably? That's, that's me. Amen. But because I'm growing in grace, I get to see how deep it his love is for me. And when I know how deep his love is for me, I can rest in the arms of the Lord. Just like that songwriter said, I will rest in the eye of the storm. So when things go bad or when I fail, I know that someone will lift me up. And when I know the grace of God is there, it gives me hope to move forward. It's like a prophetic word over and over. See, when you're aware of the grace, sometimes you just got to wake up in the morning and be aware of the grace. You got to be aware of the grace because that's God speaking. I'm here. I didn't leave you and I will never forsake you. Amen. I'm here for you. Do you see that, that you have food on your table? That's my grace. Because if I wanted to destroy you, you wouldn't have any food on the table. Do you, do you see that you have breath in your mouth? This is, you know, you feel you did wrong. Oh, I would never hear you again. But I gave you grace because I'm allowing you to breathe so that you can confess your sins so that you can be saved. Amen. You see that friend in your life that's knocking on your door telling you about Jesus Christ? Or that person on the street telling you about Jesus Christ? That's my grace. I know you backslid and, and you're so far from me, but I love you so much. I will still send my ambassadors. You know how important that is, saints of God? Amen. You know, how, you know how amazing it is when God sends, hear, hear me out for a second. You know how amazing it is when God sends an ambassador somewhere for a message? You know, like, I don't get called by Justin Trudeau's ambassador every day. You know, if you're American watching online, I don't think anybody that I know, I don't know anybody that I know that had an ambassador of, of Joe Biden coming to their house with a personal message. Like, like that's... That's amazing. If you, can, if you can see that, sister, listen, the king of all kings is sending an ambassador. And listen, there's a lot of ambassadors that Joe Biden has. I mean, there's so many countries in the world. He has so many ambassadors. So it's not about which ambassador, but the king of all kings decided to send an ambassador specifically to you, brother Andre, to specifically just to remind you that I am here. This is amazing. That's the grace that I walk by. I know that even in my lowest moments, God is there. Even when I fail, God is there. Even when I mess up, God is there because he is faithful even when I'm not faithful and that promise allows me to keep going forward saints of God I'm here to tell you to keep going forward keep going forward keep going forward and grow in his grace Titus chapter 2 verses 11 says for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men and this is what it does this is saints of God just just so that you know it, it teaches us the grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteous, and godly in the present 
world. This is what the grace of God does, okay? So the grace of God reminds you of his presence, but the grace of God points you to exactly what that, that verse said in the book of Peter. Add to your faith virtue. Add to your faith this. Because the grace of God wants you to be in the presence of God. This is why the grace of God appeared. He appeared so that we can have access to the throne of grace. So saints of God, if you want access to the throne of grace, it comes through the grace of God that was revealed. And every time the grace of God is revealed, whether it's through Christ 2,000 years ago, amen, or through a person or a situation, it's pointing you to get back to God so that you would be blessed, that you would receive the glory, that you would walk in his power, that you would know the abundance that is available. That, because the Bible says the promises of God are yes and amen. But I don't know if we've gotten to that place to have the amens in every area but we should we should be getting to that place or striving to get to the place that that what whatever we ask believing it will be done why because we are walking in his will we are walking in his presence everything listen i'm a father too and everything that my son almost anything that my son asks me even sometimes is i want a new car i want a new plane you know you know what's running through my mind you know, my, my son i bought him a, i don't even remember what the last toy i bought him a remote control robot and he says because he saw something on some kids show okay, be careful what you let your kids see so he said, I, want, I said, I don't know if they make remote control robots like for kids like that. He's like, yes, yes. And so now all that's going in my head now is a remote control robot. Why? Because my son, my son asked me for a remote control robot. Do you know that if you are a son or a daughter of God, every concern, every problem, every need that you have is running in the mind of God over and over and over. My daughter needs a husband. My son needs a wife. My 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 daughter has no job. My son uh, has no food. I, I can't let my son suffer. As long as you are a son of God, you are in the heart and mind of the Father. I know this because I'm a father and I'm no better than my heavenly father. So if it's in my mind, I know 100% that when he was on the cross, we were on his mind. Amen. In fact, the Bible says he was slain from the foundation of the world. So before we even technically existed, we were already on his mind. That means he already knew every circumstance that was already going to take place in your life. And he wrote the book, spoke it, and said, this is what's going to happen in the end. And th what happens in the end is that all that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That's what happens in the end. So I love what that songwriter said, uh, 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 that song that says, you know, I, whose report uh, do I receive? Uh, I receive receive the what how does it go whose report will you believe what is it i shall believe the report when i saw that liberated me today this is why you got to come to church you know how many many bad reports come my way uh, he's this and he's that and, and this that and this and that and people slander me left right and when i heard us i wait a second devil devil get off of me I'm, I'm going to receive the report of the Lord. I don't care what you want to say about me. You think I'm a finished product yet? I just got started. Amen. Hallelujah. Whew. I received the report. How does the rest of the song go, sister? That, we shall receive the... We shall, and, and how does it, the next part... Uh, uh, his report it says i am healed his report says i am filled i am free his report says victory wow wow his report i love the report card of the lord amen jesus wow that's the, that's the report card jesus is the report he's the report salvation is the, my report i i, I Ooh, victory amen I, I, amen i got to learn that song we got to see we got to learn these songs and bring it with us when we leave like whose report so the next time the devil says something in your head wait a second i'm not listening to you i'm listening to what the lord says amen 
Hallelujah. It says, I am free. This goes to another part of just growing with the Lord, and it's, it's keeping his commandments. Saints of God, I mean, we kind of touched on that in adding virtues. But this is what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and 20. He says, at that day, you shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. And he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, okay? And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Wow. I don't, know, I don't know if you want to see Jesus anytime soon. I don't know if you want to know the power of God anytime soon. But the Bible says right here, if you have his commandments and you keep them, okay? So add to your faith the commandments of the Lord. You know, and this is why, you know, some people just really don't get it. We're not trying to be more religious or self-righteous than anybody else. You see, when you start seeing somebody dress modest, it's because they, they, they want to keep the commandments. You see, I, you just read the word of God. I say, look, it's not my word. It's not my thoughts. Some of you are thinking too much. Oh, I don't feel comfortable in, in modest clothing. It ain't about you. It's what God wants. Your thoughts are not his thoughts. Your ways are not his ways. He, he knows something about life because some of you are not getting married right because you look like a floozy. And if you would have just obeyed God, the godly man would have looked at you and said, wow, a woman of God. Hello. Why, why did everybody go silent all of a sudden? I'm not pointing at you. I'm, I'm talking generalization. Sometimes you got to understand, pastors just got to say things. I am not targeting anybody here. And if I was, I would tell you. Amen? I would just tell you. No, I'm not targeting anybody here. I'm just saying sometimes we're just not obeying the commandments of the Lord and we're missing out on his presence and his blessings. John chapter 15 and 10 says the same thing. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. I don't know about you, but I want to make love to the Lord every day. I want his presence to fill me every day. And he says, if you keep my commandments, that will happen. That will happen. Even as I kept my father's commandments and I abide in his love. John chapter 14. And if you ask anything, verses 14, it says, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter and i can go on and on about the commandments of the lord but saints of god if you're reading the word of god and god said something in the lens of the new testament he said do it do it you might not fully understand it but that is the commandments of the lord one of the things that jesus said very clearly he said you must be born again Amen. You must be. It's a commandment. Be born again. How? How? You got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to turn away from your thoughts and let Jesus Christ enter inside of you and you will be born again. Amen. Some of you are just wanting the milk. It's too hard. It's too hard. Well, it's listen, it was very hard for Jesus Christ to enter into his throne. Amen. It took death to get there. And if you want to walk into the presence of the Lord, it's going to take some dying to yourself, too. The pathway to glory is not easy. The pathway is narrow, and only few want God. I, I, I asked a little before, do you want God? Everybody's hands went up, but when it really comes down to it, the reality is only few really want God. Not many people join the prayer calls anymore. It started out uh, powerful, and then it's still powerful, but the remnant, you know, not many people come out to evangelism, even though I, I might have to just stop church, stop the worship, everything, and just get everybody on the streets. I used to do that. For those of you that were back in the past, listen, there was one time the church was growing leaps and bounds. We had a double-decker church, and people were coming, and everybody, it was growing. But then I was like, okay, it's growing, but where, how come the evangelism is stopping? Okay, we got here by obeying the commandments of the Lord. We're not going to forget how we got here. We got into the presence of the Lord through Jesus. We're not going to forget about Jesus now. We got here by seeking the Holy Ghost and having prayer meetings, and all of a sudden we stopped. You see what happens, saints of God? That's what happens to a lot of churches. They, they start out right, and then we forget. So what I had to do, I said, you know what? Drummer, get off the drums. Keyboardist, we had a bass guitar, get off the bass. No more. We're going to have boring church service now. Everybody's going to go in circle. We're going to have Bible studies. Phase one Bible study. You got people coming to church, and nobody wants to get into discipleship. You, want, you just want to listen to me, but you don't want to have work. You don't want to study the word. You don't want to actually be accountable. Well, guess what? I'm going to force you to be accountable. I'm going to be the shepherd right now. Put down my foot, my rod and staff. Amen? 
I know that some of y'all don't like what I just said. Sounds a bit dictator-like. But sometimes God has to bring order in the house. We've got to bring it back to the way it should be. We are a discipleship mentor church where every single member evangelizes, every single one of you. And we do it as a team, and we do it individually. This is how we live. This is what it means to be a Christian. If you wanted a different type of Christianity, there's a lot of different types of churches. So once a month, I, I, I had a rule that once a month, every single member, we would go out and we would evangelize, and we did it. And that's how we met Brother Ahmed and, 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 another, and, and his brother, as, uh, you know, Ahmed's traveling and, you know, and so forth. But, but God ended up doing something different. He shifted things in the atmosphere. And even though, yeah, some people left, the majority stayed, but even though it wasn't regular church, it birthed a mature church. Amen. And that's why we are here today. And that's why we've expanded because God blesses those who keep his commandments. Amen. Okay. You don't know amens here. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sometimes it might not make sense. Jesus said this, if you confess me, I will confess you before the father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. He said, if you confess me. So evangelism is more than just saving a soul. Evangelism is also about putting you in the presence of God. Some of you don't see the power of God because you're not in, in the position to be used of God to see the power of God. You're not even on your knees. You haven't even fasted and prayed properly. You're making every excuse, and it's you. It's not God. And this comes to my next point. You really want to grow. God said it in his word, very clear, James chapter 4 and 10. He says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And this is what the Bible says, and he shall lift you up. Everybody thinks they're humble until Pastor David says, submit to the word. Everybody says they're humble, uh, you know, uh, until it means, okay, let's come to the prayer meeting. Everybody's humble until they get corrected. Nobody's really that humble anymore. Humility is a lost virtue. It's not existing that much, only in a few. Everybody's so, so humble that, 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 that they think that, you know, come to church for the first day, I deserve to be on a pulpit. I deserve to preach. You know how many young street preachers come along? They don't want to be accountable to nobody, but they want to have a mic. They want to have attention. They start their own ministry. Wow. Starting your own ministry is not a joke. Who told you to start a ministry? Oh, I got a name for it. Who gave you that? Oh, God. No, he didn't. God didn't give you no name. God didn't even call you to start a ministry. Why don't you just work with the ministry you're at? Because you don't want to be humble. You don't want to be under nobody, okay? <laughs> there needs to be way more humility. What, what is wrong with being under someone that's gone before you? You could probably be 10 times ahead if you would humble yourself than to do it on your own and recreate the wheel and learn 20 years later what that guy already would have taught you in the first couple weeks of phase one Bible study. Humility will, is where God will lift you up. Even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ humbled himself. And he was the king. So if Jesus would humble himself to the point of death and be obedient 100%, then who are we to think we know it all? Pastors call meetings and nobody shows up. Pastor called prayer meeting, nobody shows up. Evangelism call, nobody shows up. Everybody's doing their own thing. No wonder you're not getting the thing that God has for you, the blessing. The Bible says in Matthew Chapter 17 and 20, another principle of what will get you into the presence of God, how you can know God, how you can have him in your life. He says, if you have faith, as small as a mustard seed, you'll say to the mountain, move and it will move. For we live by faith and not by sight. If you can believe, okay, you got to start somewhere, wherever God has spoken to you, Hold on to that word and water that word and believe. If you can believe, all things will be possible. You will be in the presence of God if you have faith in God. And the way to get faith, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So spend time in the word and you will get faith. If you don't spend time in the word and you're just acting like a baby, slipping a little milk in here, no wonder you're not going to get the breakthrough. You're not going to have the answers. You're not going to get the glory. You're not going to get the filling of the Holy Ghost because you don't have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1. 
You want substance in your life. You want to know that you know that God is in your life. You're, you're looking at Pastor Day. Why is he so confident and bold? Is because I've put in the time with God. I put in the time. I loved God, and I love God, and I continue to love God. Past, present, and future. I want more of God. I think about God every day. If, if it was up to me, I would be preaching for 10 hours right now. I can talk about God. I can dissect every scripture and go left, right, and center and, and come up with, because I'm thinking, because God is my life. He's my breath. He's everything to me. I'm not saying I'm perfect at all, but I've come to see that God is the best thing that ever happened to me. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. And this is why the Bible says, walk with the wise. Proverbs 13, you want to grow, walk with wise people. Cut off those cantankerous, weird friends, gossiping friends, friends that just slander all day, friends that are negative all day, friends that, friends that are not, they're not wise. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 and 20, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and you're going to get in trouble. Saints of God, walk with the wise. The Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Who is wise amongst you? James chapter 3 talks about two types of people that think they're wise. The ones that are contentious and fighting and arguing and slandering all the day. The Bible says that kind of wisdom doesn't come from heaven. It, it's earthly, sensual, and devilish, James chapter 3 says. But the wisdom that comes from above is for us pure, peaceable, merciful. It's different. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Walk with the wise. Walk with those who are mature. Not little kids that think, think that, they, that, that they know it all. That's not the wise. And there's many people like that in this world. Wise people act differently. Associate with fools. Get yourself in trouble. And one more thing that I want to leave with you before we, we just take this home here is suffering actually brings growth did you know that running from your suffering is not always the right thing to do running from problems is not always the right thing to do avoiding criticism is not always the right thing to do sometimes we need a critic in our life sometimes we need correction in our lives that's why some people, you know, when I hear, you know, some people's reasons of why they don't go to church, it says, oh, the pastor's always speaking about me. No, it's not the pastor speaking about you. It's the Holy Ghost speaking to you. I get accused of that all the time. It's like, Pastor David, you were saying this to me. I'm like, I don't even know your name. What, what? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not going to lie. Some guy I do not know in New York said, I, I forgive you, brother. And I said, about what? I said, you don't know what? I'm like, no. Who are you again? You don't know me. Don't act like you don't know me. And I'm like, no, seriously. I'm not even trying to say this. I, I just don't know you. He's like, you know me. I'm like, I, I don't know you. He said, yeah, yeah. I, I, I came to, to CFM New York. And I'm like, send me a picture. And he sent me a picture. I'm like, sorry, bro. I, I don't know you, man. And he said, why well, I forgive you even if you want to admit it or not? And I'm like, no, seriously, I'm not even trying to be proud. I just don't know you. I mean, when did I, if I, if I don't know you, how did I speak about you? I don't even know you. He's like, what happened? He's like, well, you, you said this about me. I'm like, honestly, bro, like, I love you, man, but I did not speak. I don't even know you, bro. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know, man. I, it's not, I get accused all the time, you know. Don't run from church if the pastor says, even if he was calling you out, is it true? Be humble, saints of God, because this is how we grow. That suffering will produce something in you. It will produce character. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, if we suffer, we will also reign with him. Now, this is just talking about persecution. But it says here, it says, if we deny him, he will also deny us, saints of God. Don't deny the chastisement of the Lord. The Bible says that God chastises those whom he loves. It says in Romans chapter 8, 17, it says, If we're children, we're hares, and if we're hares of God, we're joint hares with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we will also be glorified with him. 
we will be glorified when we suffer with him because Christ suffered for you. So we are identifying. You say you want to know God, then you got to know his suffering. You say you want to know God, then you got to know his words. You say you want to know his presence, then you need to be in his presence, the house of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25 says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of those internet YouTube Christians that want to watch church on TV but don't actually want to be in the house of the Lord. Don't be like them, but exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, the reason why we have the church is because this is the body of Jesus. This is the body of Jesus. You know, in a relationship, even an intimate relationship, you know, they don't kiss all the time. A lot of the time, it's hand to hand. It's touch to touch. And guess what? That's the body, not the head. So imagine how much more of an intimate relationship with God can you have when you're around the body of Jesus Christ. Come on, are you getting that with, with me today? Hallelujah. We can get a hug from Jesus just by coming to church. We can get a handshake from Jesus. We can be given blessings with the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord is not too short that it can't save. The hand is the body and the body is the church, saints of God. So when God is trying to distribute his gifts, sometimes it comes by the laying on of hands. Sometimes when God is trying to bring healing to your life, it comes through the body of Jesus. Sometimes when the demons have to come out, it comes through the body, which is the church. You can't get that all the time just by yourself. Sometimes you need to just come around the people. The edification comes through the body. The Bible says in Hebrews, Ephesians chapter 4 and 11, God gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? He gave some like me to be apostles and some like Brother Andre, some like Brother Harold. He gives different gifts. Why? It says here in verses 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Jesus Christ. Three things, edification so that you can grow. The work of ministry so that you're empowered and the perfection of your faith, the perfecting of your holiness, the perfecting of your lifestyle for the for the sorting out, for the ordering of your house, the ordering of your marriage, the ordering of your finances. All of these things come through the body of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but just saying that alone should ensure that every single person here comes to church again and again and again and stops running away. If you're a visitor here today and you're not a, a belonging to a Bible-believing church this is a church for you you need to find a church if it's not this one go to a church that you can be a part of because it's the body of christ that edification comes through hallelujah you want to grow i don't know if you still want to grow how many of you still want to grow amen okay amen still your hands are up amen i'm just gonna summarize that but one thing i just want to just uh, point out here we're talking about knowing God. And Jesus said something very clear. He says, no one comes to God but by me. But by me. If you really want to know God, it needs to start somewhere. It needs to start with an acknowledgement that God's ways are not your ways. You are a sinner. He's not. He's righteous. You're not. And the reason why Jesus is the way is because he's the bridge. He's the one that gave his life for you and for me so that you can access the throne of God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God but by me. It starts with Jesus Christ, saints of God. It starts with knowing him. And if you can know him today, if you can access him, if you can believe with your heart that there is a way to God, it's through the blood. And as you ex receive the blood, as you receive his death for you, then you're, then you're willing and ready to receive the rest of his ways. I'm guaranteeing you today that you can experience the glory of the Lord on a day-to-day -day basis. And this church is going to be more on fire. You're going to be more on fire, but you've got to want it. Your heart has to want it. Your heart has to really want to be saved. Your heart has to start stop making excuses why you sin, why you're watching porn, why you're lusting, why you got to stop. You got to say, I really want God. I can't do it for you. God can't do it for you. All he can do for you is send his son, Jesus. He can give you the Holy Spirit, but your heart has to be willing to receive it. 
just going to ask if everybody can close their eyes for a moment. I'm going to call our worship team forward. And, and Brother Andre, Brother Luke, if you can come and join me in the front. Brother Harold, amen. And our steering committee, those who you know who you are, if you can come to the front. And those on the steering committee, if you're not already in the worship. Hallelujah. Amen. We have a team here and we're growing as a ministry and our leadership team is up here we're willing to pray for you if you're here today and you're saying you know i want to know god more i want to give my life to the lord if you're here today or you just need prayer for whatever it is i want to invite you to come forward to this altar we want to pray for you we have leaders here this is our steering committee we have about 10 10 or 11 leaders here with some some are in a different room right now but praise the lord we would love to pray for you is there anybody you could even just raise your hand or just come forward amen come forward listen you got to make up your mind i can't do it for you but if you're here and you say i i need jesus i'm ready to come forward i want to give my life to you i want to know you more in a deeper way amen this altar is for you that's what this altar is for. Hallelujah. That's what this altar is for. That's what this altar is for. You don't have to carry your burdens anymore. Come quickly now before you he closes the door that's what this altar is for hallelujah father god i pray for all those who came up to the altar today lord god that you minister to them even right now touch them by your almighty hand, Father God, because you are able to do what man cannot do, Father God. As they have cried out with their hearts to know you, I pray that you break the spirit of pride, break that foul spirit of compromise, break that thing off of them so that they would walk in the power of the Lord and in the disciplines and in the virtues of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Cover them right now by your power, by your blood right now, Lord. Sat saturate them, Lord God, with your glory so that they would rise up so that they could be the men and the women of God that you called them to be, Father God. Cover them, O oh God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord for what you're about to do we receive your promises we receive your promises i declare I declare unto you today that the promises are for you the promises god saw you on the cross god knows your pain he said by my stripes you are healed you are healed god is trying to give you an obedient spirit a heart that is yielded to him Lord God, give them faith today. Give them faith. Give them faith, faith, faith to press in and to believe what seems to be impossible. In the name of Jesus Christ, bring breakthrough right now. Healing, healing and deliverance in the people of God. Right now in the name of Jesus Christ, that's what this altar, that's what this altar is for. You don't have to carry. You don't have to carry your burden. Hallelujah. Just stretch out to the Lord. If you're at this altar, just believe God. Just, just stretch out to Him and believe what God is about to do, what He's going to do. Hallelujah. He loves you. Don't resist. I know you may not understand everything, but but God understands what you need. God knows your pain. God knows every part of your life every issue every demon everything that's tried to affect you destroy you god knows all about it and he's able to fix it he's able to fix it you just need to stretch your arm heart out to him and he will minister hallelujah 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 that's what this altar hallelujah you don't have to carry your burdens. You don't have to carry 
your Hallelujah. presence anymore. Hallelujah. Come quickly now before he closes the door. That's what this burden is for.